Okay, okay, thumb. Okay, I can see a thumb. They're starting. Thank you. So, so thank, thank you for coming, um, and also to people watching online and following on Twitter. To Art and Future Resilience is the fifth in our series of free exchange events. This series is part of the Outdoor Institute of Art devised by Yasmin Canvin, which is an alternative art school with a curriculum consisting of discussions, skills, knowledge sharing events between artists, experts in relevant fields, the art sector and members of the public. We like to our free exchange to take place in relevant locations. So this evening, seeing as we're talking about future resilience in the age of the Anthropocene, we thought it would be an interesting experiment to hold art and future resilience outside, around a fire, thus transporting ourselves back to an age before we humans decided to cause havoc on Mother Earth. These Danish shelters in fine, fine shade woods are managed by Tinder Sticks, an organisation who are a social enterprise delivering bushcraft events and outdoor education on behalf of the Forestry Commission. So as I mentioned, our theme tonight is art and the future resilience and our speakers Bolton. Rob is a sculptor who works primarily using sand cast lead and as a senior fellow of the Higher Education Academy. He gained a sculpture degree from Wilbledon School of Art in 1993, followed by an MA in Graphic Media in 2007. His interests include the elusive status of objects and things, the condition of repetition, temporal anxiety, and the Anthropocene dilemma. Nick Bolton is the co-founder of Electric Corby, which is a community interest, interest company establishing Corby as the UK's leading community scale demonstrator location for future sustainable living, working and transportation. After Rob and Nick introduce themselves in more detail, we'll open up the free exchange and our audience is welcome to join in, ask our speakers questions or equally sit back and listen. We also welcome questions from our Twitter audience and Jessica here will be tweeting throughout the discussion so that people contribute online. <laughs> so I'd like to invite Rob and Nick Bolton to introduce, oh sorry, introduce uh, Nick Bolton to introduce himself and Electric Corby in more detail before heading over to Rob who has an introduction with a difference. Okay. So Nick if I could start with you. Yep. Okay good evening. Um, my name is Nick Bolton, Electric Corby. Uh, we're a community interest company uh, set up, blimey, seven years ago now, really to fundamentally support the growth and regeneration of Corby as a place. It's gone through quite a journey uh, over the last hundred years or so, uh, growing massively, sort of shrinking, and then growing again massively. Um, and uh, we, we were established with the support of the local council and the local private sector really to try and support that growth and regeneration and um, coming at it initially from an economic development perspective commercial uh, all of the things you might associate with a growing town and a growing place but actually we decided that there was a real opportunity to do things a bit differently or there was a great opportunity to take the growth that was starting to happen and uh, tweak it slightly if we could or influence it in some way um, so I mean I've, you can't see the slides, you'd be pleased to know you're not going to get slides at this end but people online can see slides and I've put the title of Contributing to the Anthropocene, I can't even pronounce it now, um, which is the sort of contribution that we're trying to make and trying to make that a, a positive one beyond just achieving uh, sort of mechanical growth or numbers of growth, we're trying to make it the best we can possibly be. So uh, having been, as I say, set up back in 2011, uh, we've done a whole host of uh, research and development projects trying to put Corby on the map as a place where uh, new and interesting growth can take place, not just a housing estate, not just an industrial estate, not just for as fantastic as it is, a new town centre and a new uh, arts theatre and so forth, but actually you know, how can those places, those assets, those buildings be 
fit for the future and how can Corby be a place that's resilient and fit for the future. Um, I'm going to send a, we've got a slide on there, I'm going to send a piece of paper around which is sort of probably um, some people's perception, uh, certainly outside Corby, of, of what the Corby story is and it's essentially the sort of industrial uh, shockwave that went through the town in the early 80s when the steelworks was closed and came down. Um, but that was after a massive period of, of growth. Corby was a village of a couple of hundred houses in the early 1900s and grew to 50 odd thousand people at its peak in the, uh, in the, in the 70s. And a huge amount of change went on obviously in the town and the surrounding area as, as a result. But, um, but that shockwave you know, hit the town pretty, pretty hard and uh, a number of attempts were, were made to try and regenerate and get the, get the, uh, the town back on its feet, um, some of which were successful and some of which were, were less so. But um, in the early 2000s there was another attempt made to, to regenerate but taking a, a different approach, actually what worked in the first, the first time around for Corby was, was growth. Um, and rather than just trying to regenerate what was there, maybe use growth as a mechanism to help regenerate. So if you're going to make a, your town centre better or your, your, your town better, bring new people in, bring new thoughts and ideas in, bring new spending into the area, bring new businesses into the area. Uh, and that was the bedrock of, uh, of a growth agenda that, that really got going again in the early 2000s. Um, and I was part of an organisation at the time that was set up um, to try and support that growth and regeneration and we managed to leverage an awful lot of government support into the town and into the area um, and a lot changed, started to physically change in the place and some of the building blocks for growth were put, into, put in place. Um, new symbolic buildings to sort of demonstrate and symbolise the change that was, that was happening but lots of, uh, lots of infrastructure put in place, new train station um, and uh, yeah, so uh, an, an awful lot of momentum starting to be, to be built up uh, in change terms. And I'm going to skip my slides around, Martin, I'm really sorry about that. But really, Corby is, is sort of at the centre of the single biggest growth area outside London. Massive amount of change going on um, uh, as an area and thousands and upon thousands of homes around Corby, but also Kettering, Wellingborough, this whole part of the country huge amount of change um, and there was a real concern and danger as I say that that was going to just be dormitory towns, dormitory housing estates for, for other places, for London to thrive or to London to let off, let off steam. And uh, So when we did establish uh, Electric Corby and, and I'll come back to the name in a minute because it, people have a certain expectation about what Electric Corby means, um, but we, we were set up really to, to try and make interesting projects happen. Um, and we funded ourselves from doing research projects. We got a lot of uh, government support, a lot of European support. Ironic to say that on a day like today. Um, but an awful lot of uh, EU support came in to get uh, research and development projects going. But we also started to get some commercial projects going. Although we're a community interest company, we're absolutely out to demonstrate that sustainability can be economically sensible. It's not just a nice to do, it can be really a way forward for for a community and for the economy. Um, and then, but we were absolutely focused on how we can provide social benefits. So as a CIC, um, a community interest company, we have a, our, our articles of association as a company, I mean we can only make money, and we are there to make money as well, if that goes toward the benefit of the, of the community. So we don't have shareholders, we don't have uh, uh, dividends given out and so forth. Any, any benefit that we generate goes to the local community. Um, and that also drives the sorts of things that we do. Um, so Corby, and this is more for the benefit of people who, who aren't around the campfire here because they know exactly <laughs> what's around Corby. There's some fast, fantastic and un, unexpected things within, within Corby and within striking range of Corby. And I've got a, some slides. Again, this is for people who, who know Corby, but they know these things are, are around. And there's a second one I'll send around, which is a little bit more surprising. I'll send it the other way. Um, you know, that people now, their expectations of Corby, I think, will be um, challenged if they come here uh, 10 or 15 years after that growth agenda 
took off. Um, but I think there's a lot of physical things have happened and a lot of economic benefit has come from that. But actually what drove it a lot at the time, and Ros and I know a couple of the individuals of old, there was a lot of individual people who really took on the challenge and got together um, at key, in key leadership um, within organisations in the area and uh, at the borough council and the developers and in central government there's probably half a dozen maybe eight or nine individuals who really got together and, and, and agreed that something needed to be driven forward and, and but it wasn't easy oh, hello. Um, there was still a fair bit of tension and especially when we sort of started to spread out and try and get other areas involved in the growth agenda Kettering, Wellingborough other places there was definite tension and um, we started to try and brand the place which was another interesting challenge so we started to give it a sort of a bit of family um, some family views on how places could be named and called but actually um, as the next little slide will show that can cause its own problems as well so families don't always get on um, they have different views they have different perspectives on things and uh, they can be coherent from the outside, but actually inside they can be quite challenging. Um, and our, our part of our role was to try and uh, uh, try and bring those individuals and those organisations together, and um, and push forward the the agenda of, of growth for for the area. And um, but coming back to the people thing, the, the risk really was that we were building new things, but. Um, you know, how, how do uh, how do the people benefit from that directly? And the, you know, there's a seeing a place regenerated doesn't mean that you can go up to the cube and, and say that's fantastic, that's cool, we regenerated. Um, how how are uh, people on uh, on some of the, the housing estates, the established housing estates, really feeling about that change? Uh, and the answer was they were pretty remote from it actually, and um, and, and feeling like yes, it's great. They were proud and if you talk to them they were definitely could see the benefits that were that were happening or the changes that were happening rather but weren't necessarily feeling it themselves so and we we did a lot of programs going out to the schools trying to talk about the change that was going on and there was um you could start to feel the palpable change uh, talking to the uh, young people in the in the schools but they were reflecting stories from their families that that experienced the the 80s and the 90s where um, you know, they were definitely sceptical that this was really going to change Corby. Um, so that sort of, a double, sort of redoubled our, our commitment to try, and, uh, to try and do more. So we, we've, Electric Corby set out really to try and drive uh, new ways of thinking about transport, new ways of thinking about the houses and the buildings that we live in and, and operate in, and new ways that we power all of those things, power our, our homes, power our vehicles and um, we've been attracting projects to, to look at new forms of rege renewable energy, renewable generation, how people can manage their energy much better um, and also how the buildings themselves can help that happen. Um, we were reflecting earlier and I know we're going to talk in a bit but we were talking about the homes that we live in and although I live in a relatively new house it's nothing like as well insulated as it should be um, and I, I, I live off gas as well so I have oil fired heating and I'm constantly watching the markets about how things are going and, and I shouldn't in, in the modern age when my home was built in the, in the mid 90s you know you shouldn't be having to do that necessarily and people living in homes built in the 60s and 70s you know are wrestling with that uh, challenge of heating their homes uh, inexpensively and it's very difficult to do so um, I'm going to skip a couple of slides. So what we've what we've sought to do is set up two two big projects now. One is uh, Corby Community Energy, which is trying to encourage people to uh, switch to green energy if possible, but certainly cheaper energy uh, solutions, and start to support people and businesses in finding ways to manage their their energy better. But actually, with a real um, there's a there's a uh, technological heart to what we're trying to do as well which is gather data and information about how people do that and how people are controlling their 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 homes and that's not about 
spying on people or finding out how they live their lives, but it's actually using that data to help the system work better. So if you can start to, if you can imagine, you know, uh, a school is operating uh, during the daytime, generating uh, a lot of demand on the grid, but it's, it's also got solar panels on its roof, which are helping that. Um, come the weekend, that school's sitting there with solar panels, still, still pumping out electricity, but nobody there to use it. So what happens to that electricity? It goes to the grid, maybe. Um, <laughs> but actually it could be helping the local housing that lives nearby. Now that sounds really simple, like we can just somehow plug those two things together and it's not that easy at all and you need lots of data, lots of information to, to make that happen. And that's just one very simple example. It happens at an industrial scale as well. There are businesses using energy and generating energy at all sorts of different times. And it's what we're trying to do is find a way to manage that better within, within Corby and retain the good generation that happens here, but also um, manage the demand in a way that uh, reduces costs for everybody. So we have a community energy project that's doing that. Um, and we also, we're also putting our money where our mouth is, or, or at least some government money where their mouth is, uh, to try and build better homes. So we've started building some things called zero energy bill houses. And we've, uh, uh, interestingly, we've deliberately said not zero carbon houses, although that comes along the journey with going for zero energy bill, because ultimately it's, people care about their bills, if truth be told. Lots of people care about carbon as well, but actually the majority of people and people living potentially on fuel, in fuel poverty care about their energy bills. So we've gone for homes that are targeted at zero energy bill, and uh, that's about improving the fabric of the house, that's about generating energy on the home if you can and about managing that better and being aware of it. So the, if you're aware of how you're using your energy you're much more likely to be um, cautious with it or careful with it. Um, so we, we started doing that and we found that actually the biggest challenge was people don't know how to build houses very well in this country. Um, there's a massive problem between what's, uh, how buildings are designed and how they're actually built uh, and that gap tends to mean that they're not very efficient. So we had uh, a bunch of houses built um, and they were something like 200% worse than they were designed to be in terms of their energy performance. So their bills in theory would be twice what they could have been. Um, so uh, what we did to them managed to reduce that gap a fair bit, but really not, not enough. So we're now doing, we're now in the middle of a project uh, which we're calling ZEB2, which is our second wave of houses. And they're being built uh, in a wholly new way, using what they call modern methods of construction. Uh, they're not made out of bricks and mortar. They're made out of panels that are built in a factory and brought along onto site and slotted together like Lego. But they're incredibly strong, incredibly well insulated. They're um, incredibly sound insulated as well. Um, and they make really re close to passive house homes for anybody that's aware of passive house homes. So. We've done that as a starting point, but then we've also built in uh, a whole renewable energy system into the houses. So they generate their own electricity and their own heat from the roof with solar panels that are combined solar thermal and so solar voltaic. And they take the excess heat during the summer and they put it in the foundations so that come the winter, the heat pump that's actually running the house is drawing that excess heat back out of the foundations and making the heat, the house that, that bit more efficient. Um, and what that means is those homes are technically uh, energy positive. They're generating more energy than they're actually consuming. Um, and that allows us to store heat. We've got battery in the home that allows us to store the electricity during the day so that we can have the lights on in the evening. Um, and uh, we've, we're in the middle of building those right now. So if you come up to Corby, come into the middle of Prior's Hall Park, uh, right into the centre of the existing buildings, you'll see a little island of houses that are going up. And in fact, I'm going to send you a picture around, which has got... Oh, no, I'm not. Sorry. I didn't manage to print them all off at the last minute. On the slides, there's pictures of those homes. One of the things we call them, though, uh, and this comes back to people, because it's, it's, there's a real danger that we'll get swept along with technology and we'll get slept, swept along with building great things. And actually, um, again, it comes back to people and, and, the, uh, and how they're going to be lived in and how they're going to be enjoyed. So we've designed these homes also to be lifetime homes. Um, 
the idea being that you can come into this home and it's flexible enough uh, and resilient enough for you to stay in that for the rest of your life. If you, if no matter how your life may evolve in terms of your own physical abilities or, or whatever, the home can adapt to that. And in fact, but the challenge we had, and lots of people say, well, that means bungalows, and that means uh, that takes up lots of space. And how are you going to do that in a growing town when space means money? So we're building what we're calling vertical bungalows, essentially which means uh, they're already either got fitted or ready fitted or are able to take a lift in a three-storey townhouse. So you can come into that, that home and you can either have it fitted at the beginning or you know that if in future you want to have the lift fitted, it's actually a case of lifting a panel out of the way and having the lift installed. There's no structural changes to the home that you need to do. Um, and we're also trying to, we've built the, the homes in something of a, of a mini community within a community so that the different age groups across the, the, uh, the housing can hopefully interact. We've designed the centre to be a communal space uh, with a tree in the middle, um, which there aren't many trees on Prowse Hall Park if you've been up there. And we're actually going to put a, a semi-mature or a mature tree in the middle. It's going to move it from one of the woods on the edge and bring it in and plonk it in the middle of the, of the community to help create a community space um, because we're ultimately conscious that it's, um, it's, it's people that are going to make these communities and make the place work, not all the clever things we try and do from a technological point of view. So uh, some of the things that have fed the work and the projects we're now just moving on to has been that thought that um, we're doing all these things and uh, is it, are we thinking about the end user, are we thinking about how people are going to interact with all of this? Um, and there's another slide here, which is the thing that's come, come to my consciousness quite a lot recently, especially with young teenage daughters, which is digital overload. Um, and I think we're all feeling that a little bit. And if we start putting all this clever stuff in a house, actually, is it going to be too much for people? How do we simplify it, make it so that it's a, it's a contribution to their lifestyle, not an added thing that they've got to think about, an added thing that's going to interrupt the way they live in a home? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going on. I said I'd talk quickly, and I'm talking sl more slowly. So, um, so I am going to, I am going to wrap up. Um, so, yeah, I, I think a lot of our thoughts at the moment is about how you create connected communities, how you use uh, the way we build places and the technology that we install into places, how we actually make them connected from a community perspective, not just from a technological perspective. So that's a lot of the work we're trying to do at the moment. And I'm keen to sort of understand how people think about how places are growing and changing um, and talk about that. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Nick. So we'll hand over to Rob now. Uh, this is going to be difficult. Um, I'm obviously coming from a very different point of view, looking at a slightly more kind of global point of view. And last sort of two years, thinking about issues of climate and the Anthropocene, it's going to take a radical change in terms of how we think about our future and about our developments. So what I'd like to present to you tonight is a little text that is about the thinking that sits behind the making. So I'm a sculptor, I make things. That has an impact. Me being an, being an artist within the 21st century, that has an impact on the environment. So how do I reduce that? What is my personal impact, both in terms of local, and global. We all have an impact. So, can you hold that just for a wee yeah. sec? What I'd like to do is just to hand out a couple of objects to give you a bit of a focus on the actual words themselves. So these are, and you'd like to possibly pass these round as I'm talking. Some of these are slightly heavier than others. These are in a way act as a bit of a kind of a focus on some of the text. So what I'm going to talk about in a sense is reflecting on the weight of industrial progress, what I call living fictions of purpose and importance. Another way of putting it, what I call looping in the grey of one-sided conversations. Monotony is always present as an element in the potentially unlimited. Let's get the day over with then and sit at the cold edge of loss. 
as the Etamu sits and sits in the darkness that cloaks all experiences, shabby doubles of their earthly forms. Nah, carpe deum, carpe deum. But look again at the sullen formlessness of the grey every day as it seduces through conformity and standardisation. Will our malleability through habit and tradition confirm that we are simply pattern processing machines, born out of pattern and destined to live our lives as pattern? Familiarity gives meaning to life, cushioning our inherent dependency. But the human journey does not return and the future is but a quack at the court of Kronos. Carpe deum. As time is rhythm, not the recurrent beats of the rhythm, but the gap between two such beats, the grey gap between black beats, the tender interval. We're creatures born to navigate and live in an ever-changing presence, the tender present of our lived experience. We must live and make do. But what have we done? We have become the material of age and wear, the greyness of weariness, the expulsion of everyday kindness. Our time must be that of the Catholicine, an epoch of greyness for our days of indifference, for our dying together. A time too heavy to bear in that grey gap of time we call our lived experience before we sit and sit forever in darkness. Our anxious being, a place where Cupid's lead-tipped arrows of hatred and loathing are forged. One blunt and tipped lead, whose base allay provokes disdain and drives desire away. For this is the sullenness of lead, refulgent in youthful self-regard to then choke under an unbearable weighted cloak of grey for the sleep is long and deep. Lead's weight and benevolent neurological toxicity conflicts with its supreme malleability and stoic resistance to environmental decay, all beautifully antithetical conditions. Materials set in both the mythic past and for our eco-anxious hyper-modernity, pulsing to kill both slowly and quickly. Have you forgotten the alchemists have you given up hope and turning into gold? To bribe the love and make the lover bold? As some golden age continues to beat out the grey hours, the time to fill before we sit, we expect repeatability and consume consistency. Confirmation through repeatability qualifies our endeavours. Pattern is control and safety. It is titanic, ubiquitous, and blind. Pattern gives continuity without consideration. It simply is the greyness of our anxious being. I've always felt an anxiety over time. At least I think I have. I cannot remember another time, but how far back can I really remember in this delirium? Rhythm Analysis, 1992, Lefebvre's last work and published posthumously concerns times out of time and rhythm as a methodology to interpret and analyse our contemporary lifestyles. He considers our organic selves as being in conflict with the mechanistic character of our contemporary lives. Our bodily metronomes are organic and run on the rhythms of respiration, hunger, thirst, sex and sleep. We are, however, incredibly adept at manufacturing machines that fuel our anxiety, machines that hasten our annihilation by increasing the tempo of our lives. The body as a metronome is, for Lefebvre, about our consciousness. He states that to grasp a rhythm, it is necessary to abandon oneself to duration, to abandon the presence of the present and to become immersed in an expenditure of time. 
Our bodily metronomes must be consciously acknowledged in order to successfully navigate the world we inhabit. They act as sounding boards resonating with the pulse of our times. But our time now must be that of the Catholicine, an epoch of greyness for our days of indifference, for our exceptionalism, the grey time of our dying together. To endure, we live for longer, but die ever more slowly. On our greying planet, the incalculable absurdity of a global economy fundamentally at odds with our shared ecology. The immaterial flows of commerce, a fiction of progress constructed from pure human exceptionalism. We, the first of last men, trade more than futures. These transactions create a terminal velocity in which we attempt to live a myth not yet even imagined. We are faced then with the new and inescapable reality in which the worldwide blindness of our impact is matched only by the eco-anxiousness of the few. Willingness alone simply produces an artifice of meaning and self-indulgent virtue signalling, conflicted anxieties of which I think we are all guilty. So in a sense, it's a real reflection and a recreation and a thinking about how do we tackle. Things are not just about the Western world. This is a global response that we have to be thinking about. And my fear, my anxiety now, thinking about issues across the country, think about the kind of globe, is that we are in danger of greenwashing a real danger of being blinkered in terms of where the industrial progress is going to continue. So it's fantastic and it's brilliant, but is it the right thing to do? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we're going to open it up now. Have <laughs> anybody's got any questions? Um, or you can chat between yourselves, yeah. or if you have any questions, Nick, to ask Bob, or vice versa. Uh, not necessarily questions, I suppose. It's it's an interesting... When, I, when I, I, I moved to Corby, or working in Corby, from Cambridge originally, and there's a massive growth plans for Cambridge as well, and that's a place that's obviously evolved a great deal over 800, 900 years. Uh, and one of the people that I work with a lot over there asked me at the time, when the growth plans were being set out, he said, that's great, that looks really good, but why? Mm. <laughs> why are we growing? And, uh, and you know, in my, in my particular profession, it was, well, that's what I do. Um, mm. And my, my sort of angle and the organisations I've worked for are more about satisfying the, the, the demand for growth, or the perceived demand, <laughs> but the real, the real demand for growth in the best possible way mm. rather than fundamentally questioning whether we should be growing or not. But I know, I know personally I, qu I question yeah. that quite a bit. I think, I think it's a massive issue. I think it's an issue because growth, growth has, has an impact. I mean, if thinking about materials we use in the world, what do you think is the largest, apart from water, the single most used material on the globe? Concrete, yeah, concrete is the biggest and it has the greatest impact on our environments. So the argument is we should just stop, stop building, stop doing things. It has a massive impact. There's a sense we have like kind of an upgrade culture, but it's too late. It's a dreadful thing to say, but in a sense it is, it is too late. We've gone, we've gone beyond that, that tipping point where the need to actually improve isn't going to meet that 2%, that 2% kind of carbon, that carbon increase. And unless we actually kind of stop with the next sort of 10 to 15 years, that all the work that we're doing will be for nothing. But the danger is we have families, we have communities. 
So how do we scare, you know, square up, I suppose to scare up, the, the, the communities with that need for support, especially like Corby. We're spending, what, 40 years since the, um, oh gosh, it's freezing, sorry. Talk about climate change, it's actually kind of quite cold. <laughs> Um, you know, 40 years since the, um, the steelworks collapsed. Yeah. So how do you, as a company, mm. how do you respond to that? So our, our role, I suppose, is, as I said earlier, is, is to try and um, meet, meet the existing need while questioning it to a degree, mm. but trying to, because actually doing it in this country, doing what you're suggesting, mm. is probably, this is the easiest country not quite on the planet but one of them to, to actually do that because we we've got the choices to be able to do that and we've got the political systems and the communication systems that would enable consensus to be built around doing that and do it but what you're actually suggesting the thing that will drive all of this is not a will it's it's population yeah. it's population growth and that Absolutely. is that is completely out of control in other places well not completely out of control but it's certainly you know um, beyond normal, the sort of mechanisms we've got in this country to control that sort of thing, um, and uh, you could culturally change things in this country potentially more quickly than you could in, uh, in 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 other places. And so, what we're part of what we're talking about actually is if we can get it right here, we can be a good example and a demonstration for other places. So, if we can show how it could be done, how we can turn our our existence around in a way to make it sustainable then it's a blueprint for other places potentially to do the same now we can't as an organization we're not about mm. you know social change and population control but if we can show give the tools to the other places um, then that's maybe one mechanism um, there's, there's, there's a danger that even in doing that it creates a problem mm. and i think there's kind of almost there's a it's how we then begin to sort of tackle this without going down that road where we are so scared of doing anything. But all of the issues that we've had, I mean, the actual timing of carbon emissions isn't from, for example, the Industrial Revolution. I mean, as a wild stab in the dark, how many years ago did that problem start? In terms of the, you know, the emissions and kind of carbon, where was the biggest increase in carbon emissions from how many years ago? Kind of curious. Thirty, yeah. yeah, between ten to thirty years ago, that is the largest amount of emissions of carbon. So we can't blame the industrial revolution. We can't blame it's thirty years ago since the Paris Accord. It's not far off from from that. The, 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 the That's terrifying. It is. But the thing that's probably done that globally is actually not this country. It's China and coal burning in China. It's probably one of the single biggest things that have Australia. changed changed that, and Australia as well. But but um, and America. <laughs> Um, but particularly China, um, and so that's that's my point. How do we? I suppose it's what, it's what we're defining as we. <laughs> we're yeah. talking about the group of people sat here around a yeah. campfire, is one we. But if we're talking about the human race, then that's an entirely different thing. And and we 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 haven't yet uh, developed the mechanisms, and the UN is, is obviously. You know, does fantastic things, but is a pitiful but, yes. um, but, yes. uh, shadow of what it probably set out to be or could yeah. be to try and show leadership on all of those things that are going to need to change, mm. change the human race globally. Mm. So I suppose our excuse is that we're trying to do our little bit to influence our little bit of the world. Um, mm. um, and if you know, the, the populations that are there are there, even if they stop growing, they're still there. So unless we talk about something even scarier than population control, then, then we need those people and places to be better than they are. Although the converse, converse argument, argument is that we in the West consume 20, 30, 100 times more resources. So if we had an equivalent changeover in terms of sort of populations, if we in the West consume, and this is another, sorry, one of those statistic things, but as an average per person in the West, how many tonnes do we consume a year? Now we're talking about all the resources, all the extraction, all the materials that go to support our Western lifestyles. 9.8 tonnes each. A year? Mm. 
I mean, it's a staggering that you're thinking about all the steel, the plastics, the oil, the extraction used to support that. That's us in the West. So the, the counter argument is actually that we need to be in the West reducing to rebalance the population because someone sitting in, say, Bangladesh or in Indonesia, they're consuming nothing by comparison. They might have a larger kind of population. The population might be increasing, but their impact is minuscule as opposed to where we are. So we've become that kind of, to use a term, the metropolis, you know, you know, Fritz Langs, we've become the ubermensch. We have become the ubermensch of global destruction. I mean, it's a really difficult thing to talk about, but it takes each, I think, and every one of us to make those decisions about, actually, what do we do? Because we're all responsible. We are all, absolutely all kind of responsible. We do less, we have blankets, we, you know, we've got these kind of great kind of endeavours of what we sort of do. And the need to happen to show the way forward. But actually, it can't just be what you do. These guys can't do it. It's how we all take part in that and how we all, from today, you know, make a kind of pledge of how can we reduce our, our impact. And it's funny saying, saying this because as a sculptor, I make things that has an impact, you know, both physically. So I'm kind of trying to reduce the physical scale of what I'm producing. I mean, the stunt recently in the Tate where somebody kind of brought some icebergs in over from there to make a point about Gopa War, and I'm thinking, really? <laughs> you know, but oh, the other question I've, I've, I've got, um, you know, how, obviously, how do we then deal with housing stock? Not, you know, from the point of a building, how do we then deal with our ancient, you know, housing stock? And I live in an old 1855 Victorian cottage. You can't heat it. That, that is, I mean, that we have about 4% of the housing in the UK is new on a, on a rolling basis. So 96% of all the houses have been there and will be there in 50 years' time. So, so the, yeah, the majority of houses will still be there in 50 years' time. And if they continue as they are, they will continue to consume the sorts of levels of carbon that you, you're talking about. So how you deal with that, I don't know. I mean, um, what one of the one of the approaches as this various different ones and again ros and i are one individual who has a particular approach to this which is knock all the old stuff down and build the build new yeah. stuff the way it should be mm -hmm. and that's the way you that as an economy because a lot of what growth growth is a sort of a self-fulfilling thing you sort of everybody expects that inflation is going to be two percent and my wages are going to go up three percent and and therefore that's how the world grows and population is going to grow by two percent and we've sort of all grown up with that and that's the expectation and if suddenly a company says well I didn't grow last year it's it's catastrophic or seen as catastrophic or if my wages didn't go up by three percent it's the end of the world so how how do you how do you change that growth mentality and how do you fuel an economy which is based on that approach to do, to do it mm -hmm. or maybe you turn in on yourself a little bit and you say actually we'll fuel growth or, or sorry our, our own success by rebuilding rather than building new so we'll take stuff down and put the better stuff up mm -hmm. and that's one that that, uh, that economic renewal mm -hmm. uh, is one way of, of keeping within a global economy that's going to keep doing its thing for a bit and so we need to survive um, we we maybe put our attention to, do, to to doing that and in the process we reducing our carbon and we're becoming more resilient because i mean if we go into what we're doing at the moment uh, I'll probably be the first person tonight to mention the Brexit word, but um, you get into that scenario, can't break down. and one of, one, of the, one of the one of the challenges one of the challenges we have is we become isolated yeah. and we're vulnerable as a nation to energy shocks. And so, and as it, we already import, you know, anything between six and ten percent of our electricity on a daily basis is coming under a, a cable under the sea, yeah. and a gas. It's it's way more than that. The, the amount of gas is that's imported into the UK. So if we start getting, you know, into a slightly vulnerable situation, we're we're far less than resilient when um, we're well, relying on all that. I guess we're in that kind of point with that resilience about kind of heat and resilience to the economy. But we still have that fundamental problem: it's the economy that's wrong. I would argue, you know, I would argue that in fact that's that's where we had the issue in in the first place. So how do you restructure society? How do you restructure? How do we stop demanding things? How do we actually say, well, what am I going to do? Now, how do we actually get to a point where we move from a kind of, to coin a phrase, chaotic individualism, 
a massive chaotic individualism to something that's more like a, a communitarian or green communitarian way of thinking about a global response to, to the problem. Because, you know, I'm of a certain age and I've had kind of near on well, 49, 50 years of self-indulgence. Yeah, it's these guys, yeah, who actually need to be vocal and we need to support the people in terms of how we do that. So the school strike and things that are happening at the moment, I think that is an absolutely fantastic way. I'm not seeing that level of galvanised response ever. So that galvanised response saying, actually, and I like the phrase, don't, you know, I don't want you to worry for us, I want you to panic, I want you to do something. And I think that is massively important. So we're in a malaise, I would suggest, an absolute malaise. And it is not just political, because actually, forget that, it's another world. It's what we do. Yeah, well, I would agree that it, it fundamentally will require that, but I think the challenge that we've got is that most people are just doing what they're doing. And there's, there's pockets of encouragement and idea and pockets of individuals that that will want to do things and try to do things, but it's a fundamental lack of leadership that's, that's, that's the problem. Indeed. And um, <laughs> uh, we're just living through a, you know, a case in point, really. Yeah. Um, but y you, you need just to, essentially trying to convince people, the problem for, for, for politicians or leaders, they don't have to call them politicians, for leaders is to try and convince somebody to take a step backwards rather than take a step forwards, which is how they, everybody might perceive it to be. Mm. And it's, it's, it's either presenting it in a way that it's a, a step sideways rather than backwards, or, um, yeah, mm. or, or find, I mean, part of what I guess we, we look to try and do as an organisation is demonstrate that it can be a step sideways or even be a step forwards, but in a, in a way that's essentially creating a, a, you know, a, a climate change step backwards. Mm. And so that, but you've got to give people those tools because they won't. No. It, they won't do it as as a population. We won't do it of our own volition. And there's a there's we, a there's a kind of creep to, kind of creep towards that, and I think it's the phrase just quickly on that yeah. point is that we've changed the climate. How is the climate going to change us? Yeah. Well, it's, it's not yeah, exactly. It's not. It's ultimately it's not the planet that's at risk. It's us actually. You know, so we're, we're the ones that are going to get wiped out. The planet will be fine. Planet's <laughs> <laughs> favourite kind of quite quite kind of throw open. open is a very interesting kind of ecological writer, Donna Haraway. She had kind of cyborg uh, manifesto, and she coined the term the Catholicine, which do with the current epoch that she has termed, not the Anthropocene, because that gives us the kind of primacy within that kind of sort of legacy, if you want a better word. But it's the idea of rewilding, the idea of staying with a problem, the idea of our dying together, which is her phrase. We recognise this kind of composting of the human species, the idea that actually the Anthropocene and us, we are simply a boundary event. Um, I was actually curious to hear more from you about how your art and specifically the objects that you passed around at the beginning kind of tie into what we're discussing. Um, and also that um, you talked about us being in a malaise. Mm. Um, and I wondered how you find space within that to be creative about on the issue. Diff Diff great, great difficulty. difficulty. Um, I'm paraphrase kind of Picasso, and he said, art is a lie through which we see the truth. And I think that, in a way, sums up a lot in terms of what I can try to do. A lot of the work I, I make derives from plastic originals that I then kind of modify. Um, these kind of plastic kind of originals, and, and plastic is the visible form of climate change. It's petroleum, it's oil. So think about Coca-Cola, think about all the plastic that we actually consume. That, that is climate change. We're sitting on some plastic bags. That's, they are, that is climate change. Hey, well, we're not, but we're okay. <laughs> so that, that notion. So for me, it's a change in terms of looking at the objects that I make. And it's a form of The way I'm throwing my hands up, I'm not sure, but it's the only way that I have to actually react to the enormity of the situation that I find. Lead's critical because lead is such a toxic material. You know, in terms of lead, in terms of fuel, lead shields us from you know kind of uh, nuclear kind of weaponry. 
it's incredibly heavy, it's very malleable, and for me it kind of sums up the alchemy of the problem of the human kind of condition because of its kind of toxicity. It's why I use that. It's, it breaks, it damages so incredibly easy, but it's also so resistant at the same time. It's the kind of the weight it has to deal with the enormity of, of the kind of problem. But in terms of my own kind of impacts, I'm stepping back. I'm not sure I can actually make work. I'm not sure that I can actually make work because everything I do, everything I produce, the heat, the making, the use of paper, you know, water goes into the making of paper, has an impact. Can we afford to have that as a luxury now? Well, that's amazing. How long ago? <laughs> Quite a long oh, time ago. <laughs> but it, it does, you get to that kind of point where you start to think, you know, I can't be banging on about this and thinking, oh, but I can make art, I can make things that contributes to the problem. You know, somehow I think, well, my work is small, has a small impact, still an impact. Does that answer maybe some of the, some of the thoughts? Um, No, yeah, no, no, for sure. <coughs> I think as artists we are questioning, like I mm. know, haven't mentioned it earlier, but I did, you know, that I'm questioning my practice. Mm. And I agree with Ros, you know, we're artists and we make stuff, and where does this stuff go? Mm. It just fill, you know, it just collates and collates and collates and collates. Um, the, the materials we use have had a damage to the environment. Yeah. You know, so I, I, as an artist I want to communicate issues, mm. but then how do I do that? Um, and it is, it is self-indulgent. You know, a lot of the time I'm, I'm making to make myself feel better. Mm. But that's, how is that helping the world? Absolutely. <laughs> you well, know, and you that's my life, that's my identity. Yeah. And it's to think about stripping that away, that's, you know, but... But if it, the, the alternative is you, you well, I assume you, you, you show it to people, you talk to people about mm. it, and, uh, and it will have some impact and change if you do that. So, I mean, the alternative for me is to pack up and go home and not make stuff in terms of change in Corby, but what would that achieve? Mm. It may would have a, an individual impact, but if, I can, if we, as an organisation, can get a whole bunch of school kids to understand how they're using energy better through the way we're doing it, and they can see how things could be better because we've built some demonstrators of how that could be different, mm. that's more likely to change more than me packing up and going home, mm. I think. the individualism so it's the mm. individualist kind of um, selfishness of using I don't know oil pastels for example yeah. or you know I like the way they sure. feel and I like sure. the way they look but then that goes against Chemicals what the I believe in so mm. but there are other materials yeah there are and it's, it's, so it's a laziness so it comes back to the malaise thing isn't it it's mm. an absolute laziness on my part but I haven't dealt with it but you know not all artists although artists generally do seem to be quite a not all artists have the same pain that you have in mm. contemplating their work. So how, you know, we need art more than ever, I would mm. say. It's nice to hear that. So I, to I help agree. people navigate their way through this. And mm. I would just say, just find different materials that are sustainable mm. and keep doing and keep creating and keep communicating your mm. own pain mm. and creating spaces for people to process their own. Yeah, it kind of begs the question, what is the work, job of work of a work of art? And that, and that is, is, is its job of work, it's got to do something. It's got to have, I guess, some kind of agency to have some kind of resonance to the culture we find ourselves in. Um, I mean, with the materials that I kind of work with, like the lead, it's all recycled. You don't go down and buy brand new, beautiful kind of, sort of flashing. It's off building sites and various other places, all completely legal, I hasten to add. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, where it went. Yeah. Um, but there's something about that kind of recycling. But also I know that the material that I could work with, there is a kind of intrinsic value. At the end of the day, that lead could be all be melted down and reused for something else, in a sense. That, that mm -hmm. physical reuse of the actual, the primacy of the actual material itself. Um, 
But I go around and say, like, and we were saying, go around to kind of art shops looking at mm. the kind of the paints, the oils, the, the acrylics, all the, the chemicals that's actually mm. made. Which goes back to how we then decorate our, our houses and the paints they used in the kind of the houses. But it's expensive. You know, think of things which are non toxic, they're massively expensive. Actually, I had a, I had a question connected back um, to the prices of these new houses. Yeah. So, yeah. Because obviously, young people would be looking to buy new houses, perhaps all our price down. I like the sound of a no bill house. Yes. Yeah. So, um, is that going to drive the Price of the houses up and just wondering about how, how you approach that. So we we're deliberately selling the houses not cheaper because we can't afford to do that. But we're selling them at the same price as conventional houses, or at least. Um, so there there, and there is um, there's a market premium if we chose to took it to take it rather of anything between six and eight nine percent more for the sort of homes. That we're talking about, but um, but we're not marketing them with that that difference. And the other, th I mean, these these particular homes that we're doing, we're we're, we're uh, are designed to demonstrate the, the 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 systems involved, and to do it commercially, we've gone for a, a market that's aimed more at uh, baby boomers and downsizers, so people at, uh, my age and over. Um, but the organisation we're working with, their primary focus is uh, is actually driving affordability and and volume. So this is going to this is going to this is going to clash here. <laughs> but <laughs> but one of the ways to drive down prices of homes is to challenge the market establishment by uh, increasing volume of homes built. Because part of the thing that th there's a there's a massive disc. And the reason why Persimmon and others make huge fortunes is there's a massive disconnect between supply and demand. They, they control supply and demand is up here and so they, they can afford to charge what they, what they like almost and that drives the market. If we come in and this is why there's been so much resistance in this country to, to, uh, to solving the housing problem by building more houses is because the, the established builders don't want you to do that because it will undermine the marketplace. Uh, from, from their point of view because you'll be able to put lots of houses out and therefore people will get, get them and the prices will level out but actually the problem comes back to all of us again mm. because actually what's underlying that is all of our houses because what will then happen is the whole housing market will start to go down and all of our own self-worth will start to be challenged by the fact that our houses are suddenly worth less than we thought they were which is an artifice that we've created yeah and that's actually mm. quite a, that's quite a british mm. stroke american thing rather than other countries but mm. it's there and, and that's, that's a, a drag on solving those sorts of problems. But as an organisation, the partners that we're with are, are wanting to, to drive that change by uh, tackling the volume for affordable housing because the system is able to be cheaper and put up faster. So it, it, it can tackle that. So it still kind of is, supports the idea we've created an economy that's fundamentally at odds with our ecology. That yeah. still drives fundamentally that issue of profits. Yeah. And I think the only way of getting around that is a fundamental restructure of our society. How do we, do, how we deliver that in mm. a country like you know, in the Western kind of world, which is hell bent on this chaotic individualism? So how do we restructure something? Because we've not really achieved that anywhere. And uh, what worries me, I'm going to use the, the B word again, what worries me about Brexit, what worries me about the kind of populism, and what worries me about this isolationism, is we have one globe, we have one problem to, to resolve, and shutting that, shutting that conversation out isn't going to work. So what, do, what we're doing, what we can here, is fantastic, but actually it's a global issue. And I don't think the perspective, or the per perspective rather, is looking terribly rosy at, at present. Hence, you know, the idea we need that radical change that's going to affect us before we start to think, actually, do you know what? Profits, the artifice of the housing market and the artifice of our economy has gone and that has completely kind of collapsed. Mm. So we are a boundary, a boundary event because we're still dealing with the, the illusion that somehow progress is going to keep on shooting, shooting forwards and mm -hmm. we're at peak civilization would be my argument. We're completely at, sorry, I'm getting emotional there. We're at, we're at peak civilization where, and we have a, we have a responsibility to ask those, those tough questions. Yeah. 
I yeah. wouldn't argue with any of that. Yeah, but, you know, yeah. it's it's it's. I went to buy some flowers, and the girl behind the counter said, "Do you want a plastic sleeve to put them in?" I said, "No, thank you. Enough plastics used in it, you know, in this world." She said, "What?" Yeah. And I said, "Haven't you heard? You know, we've got to do something about plastic." She said, "No." Mm. The other assist, another assistant, started joining in, saying, "Yeah, there's an enormous island of plastic in the ocean, and this and that." And this was girl was saying, "Really? What? Oh, oh. Yeah. And um, but is then I said. Um, you know, why has the co-op started wrapping the cucumbers in plastic mm -hmm. again? And she went, ugh, take a cucumber home without being wrapped in plastic. Yeah. That would be revolting. Mm. Anyway, Western neurosis. Like red rag to a bull for me. And I <laughs> absolutely. And then I left. The next time I went in the shop, she said, oh, I remember you. I've been thinking about what you said. And then the next time I went in the shop, she said, I've been thinking again about what you said. There are not enough people who agree with you. Nobody will bother to do anything. Mm. Yeah, well, that's th that's and the that, issue. How do you change? We keep attitude? talking, we keep shouting, we keep talking, and we have to deal with the the very the very complex, difficult, uncomfortable, unbearable, sometimes um, anger that people come with a response to that. And I think that is that is absolutely our I think our responsibility. And we can't be seen as oh God, those hippies banging on again about the climate again. You know. Yes, I will, absolutely. But we have to, in a sense, be careful we don't isolate our vision so extremely. We have to be fundamentally part of the society that we're wanting to see that change happen in. I think that is... No, she does. She's quite very young. What? Yeah. I got her thinking, and the second time I went in, I was thinking it was a bit of progress, but the third time... But it's uh. there though, it started. <laughs> Just keep going. Yeah, yeah it, it, yeah. it, it, it started. That's what frightens me. Not enough people there have a slight, quite a comfortable life. They're yeah. not going to bother. Yeah. Yeah. Unless They're not. it strikes on the personal life of each individual, this is not going to change. And it's going to be um, too late by then. Uh, <laughs> it's my thing. I'm a bit uh, like you feeling. Uh, uh, as an individual and a creative myself, I am very angry mm. about this urgency of doing something. But what can we do as individuals? Okay, maybe I choose not to buy plastic, but am I really going to renounce to drive the car and do this X amount of mile walking every day under any weather? Am I really not going to turn the light on and switch every day every single plug yes. out of? Am yes. I really going to yes. do all of these? Yeah. I might do, but... but I, I, th I, I don't think that's necessarily a good use of in individual human energy. You find the thing that you can do that will make a difference. Elon Musk, for all his faults and whatever, has chosen his particular path, which is to try and accelerate the change to electric vehicles. He hasn't tried to build a, make a load of money by selling electric cars. His ethos is to get everybody else to make electric cars. And so that's his mechanism. I'm not saying it's perfect, and there's obviously lots of things wrapped up in, in all the issues around that. But he, he, that, he has chosen to do, to do that particular method. I'm choosing a method where we're trying to demonstrate how things could be better. And artists are picking their way to demonstrate their things. And individuals may go and protest or make an individual change. But if you just do it, if you just do it in isolation without um, taking the opportunity to share that in some way mm. then it is a, it, it's not it's not entirely hollow but it's a relatively hollow gesture it, because it won't change things um i don't think it does that two things need to happen if think about you know 100 store 100 straws floating around the river so if 100 people choose not to use one plastic straw that's 100 straws less if we if we all today stop buying probably don't but coke or plastic or don't you go to coffee shops and don't buy that that'll make a difference I, and then we can then we communicate that, that as well, well that, that, that's that's the bit because if you have 100 people do that and you've got 100 million not doing that you're making no difference it's a start mm. yeah but it's it's too slow a start that's my point that. So if you just keep doing that, then you might get to a thousand people in 10 years time. Mm. What you need to do and individuals need to find their own ways to do is to, in, is to influence the hundred million. If I go and have a coffee, I will make an absolute, a bit like what you're saying, it's that look with this bloody cup again, going into wherever it might be with my coffee, you know, and I'll look at people and I'll, and I'll, I'll have that conversation. Yeah, well that, that's different. That's, yeah. that's making it, but just doing it for yourself 
in your yeah. own world is great, but it's mm. not doing the second bit. Yeah, that's a good pledge. Sorry, Adam, that's a good pledge. Pledge. Way, if, if, uh, I get what you mean by if you don't, one person does it, it's not making a big difference. Uh. I suppose the way you do that is, I know it's a short term, but for education, mm. I go yeah. to school and I'll admit it, I, I forget a privilege lab sometimes. I'll sit there and I'll write a paper and I'll doodle, but I forget trees get chopped down, stuff's being used to create this, and create it too far school. Mm. And if, say, like something like this session, even once a month, students would then be reminded once a month uh -huh. old, and then for maybe a month, because I know that myself, I don't have a ton of, uh, what's it called, I, I won't egg, egg myself on, so even if it was for a month, and then mm. another session happened, and mm. I was alerted uh -huh. how much I'm using a year, that's another month that I'll carry on, yeah. and I'll go, right, I'll try and lower it down. Mm. Before long, I'll tell my friends, they will tell mm. their friends, yeah. and so I think it's, you can try and do it yourself, but you need to try and not just you in general, but artists and yeah. builders. Yeah. If you sort of use your art to educate others, which yeah. I'm sure you do, yeah. it'll s before long a ripple effect will happen. Yeah. One person but will tell ten people, they'll tell ten people, and that hundred stores less will turn into a thousand. That stores exponential less, turn into ten thousand yeah. stores less, and before long we're getting somewhere. Even but if you, it's not we, fixed. Yeah, yeah, we've all got to look yeah. out for to yeah. try and do our own Full version sense. of that, that that blue planet moment. We've all got to. Because it's those moments that will change things, and we can't all be David Daffenborough, but we can all find those little opportunities to do things like that, mm. that spread it. And without that, I just fear it, it is, it's, it's, um, it is too late because you won't, the, at the speed of an individual, you won't get, we won't get yeah. there. And it's interesting thinking about, you know, changing industrial kind of landscape and mentioning about the kind of the electric kind of car. Mm. And another mm. phrase, which I think is a brilliant one, is that in the develops you know, ecologically aware country. It's not that all the poorest people have cars, it's that all the wealthiest use public transport. And that's the thing I think fundamentally that we need to be kind of thinking about against moving away. But where I live, there is no public transport. You know, it is really difficult. Where we used to live, London, great. But actually moving out more into kind of rural kind of communities, where is that public transport? That's got to be funded. It cannot be a profit driven, you know, a profit driven agenda. And going back to electric car, that's not going to work either. Where does, where does the electricity come from for those cars? Who builds those cars? Because I think it's Honda, or um, I think it's Honda was mentioning about moving towards the electric car, looking to make a lot of people redundant because you need less people to make an electric car because there are less bits. So less people with less jobs aren't going to buy those cars. So you've got this kind of, it's a really strange phase that we have in our yeah, economy I, I at the moment. Think, yeah, I mean, um, we started out around electric cars, and I suppose the one thing I, I was talking to Ros earlier about charge points, um, the, essentially the electric car as it is now, is just a small stepping stone. Okay. Because actually what, what, what you're gonna see change more than anything it, with, with with vehicles is how they use, not, not, not what's powering them so much. Because as you get into yeah. electric vehicles, you get into autonomy, you get into the ability to have less vehicles around because Absolutely. you there you you know instead of I mean there, an average car is used about ten percent of its time. Yeah. It's sitting on the drive, it's sitting at work, mm -hmm. it's not being used. If you when we get to the point when you can power those cars in, in a way that is uh, ecologically more ben less damaging rather not <laughs> beneficial but less damaging and you've got a lot less of them because you're utilizing each one you know nine times more than it would have otherwise been used Absolutely. that's when you get the change because again mm. people will still want to move around you're not going to drag mm. us back to a place mm. that that um you know was was you know 200 years ago i'm going to have to call this absolutely <sighs> amazing rich fantastic conversation <laughs> to a close Gosh. I know <laughs> we could I think I'd like to camp out here all night but um, I've been uh, it's been absolutely amazing and, and thank you to you both it's been absolutely incredible I've been jotting loads of notes and, and there's some absolute gems I'd love to, to share to reflect back but I can't really for time so mm. um, but we actually had some great paraphrasing going on of our own at the end so I'm just going to read out a couple of these uh, we've created an, econo uh, an economy that's, um, that's against our ecology. Mm. Um, we have to take responsibility to, to ask very tough questions. We've been living in an age of chaotic individualism 
this populism, with uh, this isolation. Um, it's a, a massive global issue. We have to have a fundamental restructure. We were talking about affordable, sustainable housing, affordable public transport. Um, so energy, resources, materials, the marketplace, politicians, leaders, individuals, artists. Um, we have to keep shouting, we have to be angry. We have to use education, we have mm. to keep going. Mm. Uh, so Adam was talking about you know, the ripple effect in schools, talking about it every month, questioning, all of us questioning what we're doing on an individual scale but also talking with, uh, we're talking about communities and your, pro mm. your building projects, bringing communities together. So questioning ourselves as individuals, questioning our friends, our colleagues, challenging each other, motivating each other, and shouting, shouting, shouting. I think, I think that is what we're gonna have to do. That's and brilliant. do it very, very quickly. Mm. And it has to happen now. <laughs> so that's our job for everyone going forward this evening and to everyone listening online. Um, so I've, as I've said, it's been an absolutely incredible evening, um, and I don't really want to do this because it. But I kind of need to promote what we're going to be doing next. It just yeah. <laughs> seems a bit odd, but um, <laughs> that's what we do. So um, um, yeah, so we we have an exhibition at the Arches, uh, Justin Carter, and um, we have some other things uh, happening. And I've stapled up the papers. So, excuse me. Um, so this is what we've got coming up. Wild Sherry, we've got Pinhole 360 Degrees Photography with James Smith mm. on the 6th of April, where we'll be celebrating International Pinhole Camera Day. Is that a real thing? <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Taking Pinhole through 360 Degrees. That's nice stuff. <laughs> Our next free exchange is Art and Landscape with Anya McCausland on the 20th of May, happening at East Carlton Park. So that's the end of that and uh, thank you so much for coming and thank you to funders and for everyone being here. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ooh. Oh. Nice to sit on my...